So hi, Frank. Thanks for being involved in this and great to get, obviously get a bit of an idea on your background and your experience and how you know it's developed over the years. Yeah, thanks, Michael. Um, again, thanks for the opportunity more than, you know, it's not about, it's good to be able to sort of spread a few memories back to other officials, you know, especially those on their pathway that we've sort of well traveled or trodden. Yeah. And certainly, I mean, people forget sometimes where the sports come from and what we've done. So I think, you know, your experience, obviously having been around a while will be sort of valuable to those people. Um, for those that may not know you, which I, I, I'm not sure how many people don't know you, um, Whereabouts, you know, whereabouts were you born where, and um, where are you living now? Yeah, originally, um, you probably get this from the accent, um, from Dublin in Ireland, but currently reside in Western Australia, in West Perth, which is like, what, two kilometres from the city centre. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, pretty much a West Australian at this stage. Yeah. And how did you, I mean, how did you first get involved in the in the sport of triathlon? Was that back in, sort of in, back in Dublin or was it out here? Yeah, uh, from 1983, um, and I came here in 1985, I did some um, pretty pioneer type triathlons in, in Ireland. And on, when I arrived here, it, there was a like a fledgling um, series just started off um, along the m m mainly beach races tied in with surf clubs, um, all organized by a load of, you know, good volunteers, spearheaded by a guy called Rob Pickard, who... Um, Still competes, um, excellent athlete, but uh, you know he he was our first president or official president and um, first life member too of WA. Yeah. Yeah. Great coach as well. Yeah. So I hear you were, you were a um, for a triathlete. You were a, a good runner. As a, not as a yeah, yeah, as a, I'm I'm not a bad as a swimmer. I make an excellent runner. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's um yeah I've done I've done ten marathons, um, but it's not about my marathon times. Um, yeah, I've, I've swam around the Bustledon jetty quite a few times and that's a interesting swim. If you, you, you get, go out pretty far in the ocean on that one. So yeah. Um, yeah, good to, yeah. Swim biker. No, no um, uh, run biker. Yes. Yeah. And obviously over the years you've been involved in the sport in many ways, but I suppose for the group here, just looking at when you first came involved as a technical official, when did that occur? And do you remember much about I those first experiences? Yeah, in the late nineties, um, my son was quite a my son and his and a couple of his friends were very capable young triathletes. So I went to a few of the events with them, sort of like guidance. And I think probably driving them there and that. And we had some disappointment, disappointing deliveries of events. So um, the ED of Triathlon Western Australia at the time, Dave Budge, said to me, Frank, the only way you're going to fix it is to become an official and sort of. So, which I did, and thanks for that, Dave. And um, yeah, it's moved on since then. Um, there was room for improvement in the program in those days. Uh, you know, great volunteers, but yeah, some new blood was was definitely needed, and, that, and I just became part of that wave of new blood. When you first did it, was there a course you did, or did it just sort of organically you sort of fell into the role? Um, a lot of it was there wasn't. There wasn't like it wasn't structured like it is now, but there was a thing in those days called the NOAS, the National um, Officiating, whatever um, scheme, yep. which did give us, which did give us a, a, a you know, compared to uh, as well as other sports, did give us a, a basis of of um, accreditation. Mm -hmm. So and it, the same, there was NOAS and NOAC, and NOAC was the coaches. So yeah, they were good. Um, it was pushed heavily in those days by. Murray Hilder and um, Jane Seaborn from from Canberra said so that yeah they were sort yeah. of my mentors in that area yeah so and how did I mean questions. obviously a lot of people come into the sport and yes they do have mentors like that how did those two people sort of influence your career as an official? Um, oh, Jane as a she had she had she was very exposed to the ITU long before most of us probably similar with her and Jackie and. Um, in those days, like we didn't really know much what the ITU meant because it was the international side of the sport where we did state and, and national at best. So, um, and then we, I, I was on the, what was called the TATC, the Triathlon Australia Technical Committee. And Murray was the, I think he was the like chief of officials or sort of, he was that, he controlled all the um, 
the training of officials. And I think Jane might've been the, the chair. And that was back in 2004, 2005. But they, <clears throat> they pointed out the pathway for us in those days. Mm -hmm. And certainly those early days, I mean, very, there's obviously a lot of ITU opportunities today, but those early days, what, what part of the sport did the opportunities first present themselves to you? Um, it, 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 back in those days, it was mostly local West Australian races. I mean, at that stage, we had a few national series races. We, we actually had some Olympic qualifiers in that in the, in the city. So we, 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 I knew what the, um, the Olympic style racing was, but at that, I was never like, I was only, a, you know, probably a, at most a level two official, which in mm. those days was the second tier, but, um, yeah, it was probably one of my other mentors in those days was Stuart Fuller from, mm -hmm. um, uh, he, he was very, he was highly ensconced in the ITU and, um, and another great mentor. Uh, again, all these guys much younger than me, mm -hmm. but excellent mentors because, you know, they, again, all ex triathletes and yeah, they knew the sport. So they sort of pa yeah, paved the way and obviously some of your, your, I suppose, first interstate experience was, was that sort of going over for an Ironman or how, was, how yeah, did that sort of come about? It, it's more when um, the, the Ironman Carnival travelled to um, probably the early days in Bustleton mm -hmm. and um, like Ken and Ken Baggs brought in a, a team of highly experienced officials and they shared a lot of their knowledge with us in, on, you know, across the endurance side of the sport. And it, it was a, that's when um, I, I think it was 2006, I, be, I was became the chair of the, t the technical, the Triathlon Australia Technical Committee. And I did some travel in that position as well around the States. Yeah. And how was those, I mean, those early days of, of Ironman racing, how was, and how did you find it back then? It was, it, it was a little bit different. It was probably, not probably, it was the holy grail of what, of endurance sport. It was like, you know, the magic was Kona and, the, and the, there was a lot less qualifying events for, for Kona. Um, and it, like the main triathlon, the triathlon Ironman in, in well, between Foster Turnkery and um, then moved to Port Mac, that at one stage was the only Ironman race. And you had to qualify. You didn't just pay in front up. In those days, you had to qualify through a, a half Ironman, as, as we now call a 70.3 race. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting yeah. times. I mean, it was, it was, as I said, Holy grail type stuff. Yeah. And did it, I mean, did it certainly feel that way as an official? Um, yeah. I mean, like the pressure, I mean, you can probably relate to some of the pressure you've experienced in an ITU event now compared to perhaps the pressure you experienced back then as a, as an Ironman official. Yeah. That my second year as a Ironman official, basically I was, I was um, assigned a TD role in, in, the, the this probably the second bustled in Ironman and some of the conditions that we faced in the early days down there were pretty daunting so there's a lot of getting out of bed at three o'clock on race morning and meeting Mr. Bags as Ross McGlennon would call him yeah. and you know it was yeah some hard decisions but always I mean we we always got the athletes home safe as a result yep. of those discussions yeah yep and you know, and you mentioned Ken, and obviously, you know, you've many race directors over the years. But those early days, I suppose, also just looking at how you worked with race directors, how was that sort of different to today? Do you believe? Um, I would. It'd be wrong to say that some of those race directors were amateur, but from the Latin, like amateur meaning for, for love of the sport. Um, they definitely weren't as commercial or as polished as they are now. I mean, and that's, that's just how the sport has evolved or progressed. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the, the event, the, the delivery was excellent. There was probably, you probably athletes probably got more um, value for money in those days um, than they did now. It's, it's expanded a lot. So you can't, you can't always have that magic, um, especially when you expand, it becomes yeah. diluted. Yeah. yeah, no, it's very difficult to, I suppose, to compare when it was a, you know, a one or two race Ironman competition within Australia yeah. to now, you know, a multi conglomerate yeah, that sort of controls yeah. the world in terms of yeah. Ironman. So, yeah, it's yeah. certainly very different. Um, at what point there did you then experience ITU racing? What was your sort of first experience when you move into the, the ITU realm of officiating? 
Yeah, I think probably a few of the other people who you've um, we've interviewed um, mentioned the new Plymouth 2006 World Cup. Now, at that stage, a World Cup was the highest level of Olympic um, ITU racing. Um, it's obviously now it's a WTS World Triathlon Series. But we went to um, went to New Zealand to New Plymouth. And we were, we all, um, for about a week, we sat a course under the great Leslie Buchanan, one of the most charismatic um, mm-hmm. people in, in, in the sport. So, so before, from there, sorry, sorry, Frank, just interrupt me. So before New Plymouth, you hadn't been to an ITU event of any sort? No, we, as I said, we'd seen, we'd done a few, maybe a few qualifiers of the, um, the Australian series where there was some international athletes in mm-hmm. racing in the ITU format, but the, the World Cup in New Plymouth was the um, the first exposure to the, the big league. Okay. And how was that first time going over there, to, as you say, to the big league and, and seeing it in operation? A big eye opener, but in in hindsight and in reflection, the quality of the that group of officials at that course, like it was, they've all gone on to be, you know, superstars in Juliet's gone on to be the TD at the Olympics. Um, Pete Weaver, another great guy, Ross, um, couple, as, as we know, done amazing stuff. Murray Hilder. Okay. Has, has moved on from the sport. Jackie it's, it was a huge group. I, I'm not leaving out a young, um, elite athlete, um, Chanel Barrett, who again, another sensational official. Mm-hmm. So certainly, yeah. I mean, what do you think made that group of officials so good? Because, you know, it's quite a unique, because we often go to courses and I was speaking to one person, they said, you know, they can remember like two people are still involved in their, you know, their initial course. But for that, for, for people to actually be sustainable and be good, what do you think it was back then? Oh, there was, I think there was an element of just pure good luck and magic that that group were put in, in on that, you know, put into that course in, in the same week. It was, yeah. And to this day, most of them are probably still good friends and, mm-hmm. you know, you sort of not just within sport, we still keep in touch with you. Yeah. It was, it was, it was unique. It was very structured. It was very formulated. And then two days before the race, you're front up and you're actually doing what you've just been, you know, shown what to do. Do you remember what your first role was at, at New Plymouth? Um, yeah, chief transition um, under the guidance of Jane Seaborn. So, okay. and, yeah, and I think Melinda Farr was keeping an eye on me as well. So very, yeah, very um, a deer in the headlights type situation. But, yeah, didn't have any problems. So got yeah. it done. Yeah. Um, it doesn't always obviously go to plan. I mean, there is, as you know, you've, in many roles you've been. And have there been particular challenges that sort of stand out for you? Could it be an ITU event? Could it be another event that, you know, that, that sort of sit with you? Yeah. Um, yeah, Budapest Grand Final in 2010 was like the worst weather you can ever imagine. Um, it, and the infrastructure in the, the town, like the, it was a split transition. It was an amazingly like, you know, congested um, event from both athlete movement, athlete racing. And it was, you know, it was, it was smack bang in the middle of Budapest. The, the, you know, it, you didn't get access to a lot of the course until the races had started. So, yeah, pretty and much, you, yeah. And with yeah. that, it was the weather that became the oh, complicating it, factor? Yeah, it wasn't just the weather. It was cold as well. Like it was, it was, yeah, it just seemed to be in about two weeks when you're watching the weather leading up to the event, everything was perfect. And then you got there and then, yeah, it was cold and it seemed to be like a winter triathlon. But, okay. Again, not a great team. And yeah. What made you decide to go to, to Budapest back then? Or were you um, just um, over that part of the world or? No, no, I, ha- I had some um, financial support from the Department of Sport and Recreation in Western Australia. And I did, I did um, the London um, WTS and Budapest in a six week block and then landed on my sister's doorstep for, the, for five weeks just to um, yeah, not waste any money in hotels and stuff like that. So there was so I went London, um, Dublin for a few weeks, and then off to Budapest and home. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so has it been when you've been in a leadership role where you've been particularly challenged, or you know, been you know, challenging events have been presented to you? Yeah. Well, I mean, 
I was selected, assigned the ITU TD, the grand final role for the TD grant role for the grand final in Auckland 2012. And the year before that, we had a, a World Cup in Auckland and I was TD for that obviously as well. And yes, it was challenging. Again, the weather gods didn't necessarily bless us in, in 2012. Um, some good days and some very challenging days. I think in the under 23 race, we had a um, lightning storm come through while the athletes were on the course. So yeah, again, we got them home safe. But uh, yeah, with Auckland, the, the, the team, the delivery team, amazing just yeah you, you just you thought about something and it was done it was almost like they were th they were on the same wavelength as you were and and that that's that's the differences between um having an event that's easy and having an event that you know keeps you awake at night yeah so ha as you say having that sort of loc component that works well um yeah. really does support your role as a td has there been yeah. events you've been at um, being a td or other role where you haven't necessarily felt that support from the LOC? In in some cases, it's not necessarily that they're not supportive. They just may not have had the skill set. So, you know, without being harsh, Cosimo um, in Mexico struggled, um, you know, sensational, beautiful venue. But to get road closures in the middle of a, um, of a holiday resort, um, you know, on, on quite a busy time when you've got, cruise liners, I know cruise liners are not the flavor of the month at the moment, but they were just banked up like there was a traffic jam of them. And, and we were trying to shut down roads while these tourists and thousands of American tourists were being transferred to hotels, right, you know, in smack bang in the middle of what we were trying to do. And it, I mean, they, they had run a few World Cups before that there, but I think the, the concept of a, you know, a six day grand final took its toll. Yeah. But yeah, got it done. Very warm, definitely one of the hottest humid events that you could ever imagine, but beautiful scenery, beautiful water to swim in. Yeah, I think in a lot of people's minds when they think of Cosmo, I think it was the famous sort of um, Brownlee moves, yeah. which sort of stick in people's mind. Were you, where were you around when, when that was sort of occurring? Yeah, I was controlling who could and couldn't get into the finish line because in Cosmo, I was chief bike. So I just finished that role and we knew it was with the heat, a lot of the spectators family and coaches were trying to get to the athletes as they were finishing and you know obviously a lot of the well, johnny brownley wasn't the only athlete that struggled that day we had that, that whole week we had athletes struggling so my job was trying to keep unaccredited people out of the finish area so i yeah i saw it happening it was um yeah famous you know infamous more than famous yeah yeah it's not necessarily something we like to see in the sport However, no. it's one of those moments that for whatever reason captured people's attention and their imagination yeah. of the sport. Same as, yeah, Julie Moss back in what, 1986 crawling across the finish line in Kona. It's, you know, not necessarily great for the athletes and their, you know, their memory, but yeah, something's triggered. Again, maybe in, in, in reflection, the finish of the Tokyo test event last July in, um, obviously in Tokyo, when Georgie Taylor Brown and Jess Lemont held hands, like they mm. had the race, they, they were they were they had completely cleaned up the race. They had a great um, sort of performance, and they did something against the rules. And unfortunately, both were disqualified. And yeah, and like Alistair and Johnny, they weren't disqualified because the rules were clear on that day. On yeah, unfortunately for Georgie and, and Jess, they were disqualified. Yeah. So obviously, you've seen some of the rules. Obviously. Um... I suppose develop over time in that yep. we've not, not always had perfect sort of rules and situations, but like, you know, the, the Brownlee situation, obviously the rule now has changed to yep. adapt to that. Um, has it been, has there sort of, you've been in, in cases where there has to be some sort of interpretation of the rules that you've sort of experienced? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give you another example. Um, uh, we, in the, in Rotterdam, um, and, and reflecting back to Rio before that, the Paralympics in Rio, a Moroccan athlete won a bronze medal in, in, in Rio. And like, that was one of the most emotional and spiritual um, moments to watch him come across the finish line. But the same athlete then in, in Rotterdam in the grand final was finishing in third place. And, you know, he, he'd finished, but then there was a protest where a French athlete's equipment had been moved in the same category. 
and they, there was a protest without getting into too much detail. So the protest meant that the French athlete was um, reinstated 19 seconds. Um, 19 seconds was taken off their time. And as a result, the French athlete got third and the Moroccan athlete got fourth. And on yeah, that, the, the competition jury made that decision. And since then, the concept of giving back time uh, in, it has been changed because in 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 you know in fair play yes it was a competition jury decision but and yes it was evidence based but in in the reality of the race environment that moroccan athlete would not have just let the french athlete go past he, there was nobody there for, for him to race against so he just enjoyed the moment yeah so yeah. oh, no so yeah as you say i mean that's you know fairly recent um but yeah. was it 27 yeah. 2017 yeah so it's yeah it's just it just is, after rotterdam yeah yeah Things. Yeah, so yeah. obviously, yeah, the rules continue to develop. And obviously, I mean, you've been, I know we've spoken before about a situation you you um, had to approach in Gold Coast with someone who actually beca- went on and became an Olympic gold medalist in um, Gwen Jorgensen. Do you know, yeah, I don't know if you could just sh- share you know, your experience of that particular situation. Yeah, I was, I, I was, yeah, I was obviously head referee. So um, I was just thinking who made the decision. So, yeah, Gwen came into transition two. Um, and racked her bike and looked up the road, put her, I think I remember she put her hat on, looked up the road, and then as she was doing that, the bike fell over and spun into the next, sort of spun around a bit on, into the next spot. And um, she just jumped like the avatar that she is and took mm-hmm. off on her run. And um, so I made the call that um, she had, you know, contravened one of the rules and she was going to get a 15 second penalty when she came across the finish line she did she served her penalty because it's Gwen Jorgens and so she probably had a you know a minute or so spare on the field um so she came across the finish line and queried it and I'd said to her let's Gwen we, we, we video we have video evidence and so went into the video room and she did not she said she cannot remember any of that happening as far as she was going she racked the bike and she was on the run there was there was there was no jumping over a bike but that was the focus of a of Mm -hmm. an athlete like Gwen Jorgensen like she was just looking up the road towards the next part of the race and yeah yeah still yeah yeah she wasn't didn't like the rule but yeah yeah um Something, I mean, yeah, when you talk about that, something that I've observed you do, and certainly, um, you know, be it at a briefing or, you know, in transition, you tend to actually engage um, with athletes and actually talk with them. Why do you think, why do you have that approach of actually engaging with them, even when it's not in competition? Um, it's it's a balance. You don't want, you definitely, you can't become their friend because eventually your friendship might be tested if you have to make a decision. On, on something they've done during the race. You empathize with their, you know, their professional athletes, it's their careers. You, you know, you want, to, you want to do the job correctly and you want to make sure that they're informed. So a lot of the chatter or banter between officials and athletes will be informative stuff before a race, just, you know, wh- where's the current and, you know, what's how, how tight are the corners, you know, stuff like that. Yeah, it's not... It's not sort of where are we going for a coffee or a, heaven forbid a beer or something like that after the race, but yeah. you know, a bit of that does happen. Yeah. 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 But no, it's, 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 yeah, it's, you're all, you're all part of the event, but yeah, their focus and your focus is completely different. Yeah. And still, I mean, yeah, you do have that approach also with officials in the, you know, you make friends with officials and you've got, you know, friends in lots of different countries over the years. How's, you know, how have you found that experience? Yeah, well, as I said, I've done um, eight grand finals. Um, I just, you know, two Gold Coast, Budapest, Beijing, um, Auckland, Chicago, Rotterdam, Cosinal, and back to the Gold Coast. That's a lot, and that's not counting any of the Ironman I've done, or you know, other other our, our World Cups. So, and you know, our World Series as well. So, there's, I've travelled quite a bit. Probably one of the most travelled officials. Um, from Australia, but there's a common, there's a common sort of like creed or bond between the officials. It's yeah. It's just, let's, let's just get it done. 
Um, yep. And understanding all these people are volunteers and, you know, let's, yeah, it, we're, we're not competing against each other. We're in, if you do start competing, the chances are the athletes are going to suffer and that's, that's a no, no. Yeah. Yeah. It's about the athletes. So, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, it's a really important point. You have, you are a volunteer at the end of the day. Um, but as much as you work hard at the events, I gather, you know, not you play hard, but you, you sort of have some, some good social times at events as well. Um, yeah, I, yeah, of course I do. Um, we don't want to paint. The, I know you want to be careful what you say here, but certainly we yeah. don't want to paint the picture, especially for new officials coming in that, Hey, you know, you just work hard and, you know, there's no downtime or anything like this. Like there is some good experiences you have around an event as well. Yeah. I mean, I think Ross Kappel, um, he's, he's a specialist at getting that balance, right? I mean, Ross is a very social person. He loves a bit of tourism and he'll stick extra days on before and after. And that's something I've tried to do as well. And, um, yeah, like don't just go with your binocular, you know, don't, sorry, your, your blinkers on and, um, you know, just only do the event, just think about what the local treats are, what, what, you know, the tourism and stuff like that. So, yeah, I mean, went to the, the Paralympics in Rio and went up to the statue and yeah, yeah, it was so much cloud. You couldn't take a picture of like from one arm to the other arm. It was like a mist. So we completely nothing, nothing doing there. Um, but in other places and went, um, I went to an event in Jai Guan in Western, Western China. And the wall, the great, the, it's the gateway to the wall or the part of the, the great wall in Western China, that, that part is on the Mongolian border and it's called the gateway to heaven. And that's probably one of the, it's, it's at altitude. It's one of the remotest part of China you can get to. And the, the condition of the wall there and that is just amazing. Yeah. Beautiful, yeah. clear skies because it's, it's outside their pollution zones. Yeah. yeah. So some, so some great, yeah, some great, so look outside the event and you'll have some good fun as well. Yeah. And you've been obviously involved in the sport now for, you know, 20 odd years. Um, yeah. How would you say your approach to officiating has changed over that time? Oh, yeah. I'm in a position now where I can probably, let's say, consider what I'm going to do more. Whereas, you know, I still go by the book. That's, that's a, you know, you don't want to get a step away from that. You don't want to invent rules. Um, but yes, like in, in the beginning I was, you know, you'd be as an official, you'd be looking at the book, looking at the book. I think a lot of it now is more natural and, you know, you, you, instead of the rules now, I more focus on the athletes, but at the same time, you, you know, because the rules are there for a reason that you can't have sport without rules. Um, that's so you have you just, you, you know, sometimes you have to make some hard calls. An example was uh, two or three years ago at um, 70.3 Busselton, we disqualified for second and third professional women. Um, and yeah, and that, that wasn't a nice um, competition jury, but, at the end of the day, they, they, they all win. And the, when we, we asked them, I, you know, do you understand why you've been disqualified? And they said, yeah, we don't like it, but yeah, we understand we've done something wrong. Mm. Yeah. So, it, yeah. Yeah. Now you mentioned over time also, you obviously, you were, you went to the Rio Paralympics, which is obviously yeah. a lot of people want to, you know, go to that. Um, but then we talk about, you know, the able-bodied Olympics is often a, an, another sort of mecca for people. Can you recall when you um, found out about your appointment to the Tokyo Olympics, when that was? Yeah, it was a little bit of a torture session. Um, um, I'm sure Thanos might um, eventually watch this. So on the day when we knew um, the, the announcements were going to be made, I was sitting at home, you know, re, re, refreshing the computer, making sure I wasn't missing out, missing out. And then the, I got a... Um, a WhatsApp message, um, hi, ring me. That's from Thanos. So I rang back, nothing, nothing, nothing. And I'm thinking, oh, mm, you know, why does he want to talk to me? It must, oh, it must be bad news. You, you, you immediately, you're, you're down the negative path. <laughs> so probably, oh, good, probably a good 35 minutes later, he called. 
And like, it took him about 15 to 20 minutes into the call to tell me whether or not I was going to be selected to go to Tokyo. And I'm not, I think it was a torture session. Yeah, I think it was fully intentional. Um, yeah. He told I me mean, everything you, you about everybody else. You probably else. can't remember that 15 minutes, what I actually even have talked about, because you're yeah. just waiting on, am I? No, he, I mean, in, in fairness, he did explain the whole selection and, you know, what other officials were going to miss out and, you know, how unfortunate it was going to be for them. And, and so now so I just broke into his conversation. I said, so what are you saying? Am I, am I going or am I, you know, am I going to the games? Am I going to the Paris or am I going to the back bench and, you know, be a substitute or something like that? So eventually he goes, no, 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 congratulations. Like, you know, you're going. So, yeah, but mother nature's sort of um, thrown a spanner in the works as we all know. And um Unfortunately, yeah. this July, we, we don't have a Tokyo Olympics, but touch wood and fingers crossed, legs crossed, everything yeah. we can cross, maybe, um, you know, we will have one in 2021. And if we don't, we don't. And that's, that's life. It's sad, but there's more important things than, yeah. you know, the people's health. And, you know, it's, we, we as Australians have been very, very lucky. Our leadership has, has us in a good place, as does New Zealand. But unfortunately, there's a lot of parts of the world that are, um, yeah, struggling. Yeah. A lot of a lot of really nice people are no longer with us, and that's yeah. that's very sad. Yeah, and yeah. it is. I mean, we're obviously everyone watching this obviously wishes for the Olympics to go ahead, and you'd obviously have that opportunity. Um, yeah. But certainly, is there anything? What? What? How are you looking forward into the future as far as an official goes? Um, you probably put me a little bit on the spot there. I hadn't looked past um, Tokyo. Um, so yeah, I've got a, a year in the middle. Um, I'm quite, I'm very comfortable that there's, that there's enough young, younger people to, to take the positions and, and the ITU, um, have, you know, they've got a very strong development program. So there's a lot of people in place. So if I take a step back or take a, you know, decide to not officiate in the future, um, that's not, it's not a problem. Um, I'm sure there's a little, you know, there's, People, I'm, you know, I don't look it. I'm sort of well past sixty now, so um, yeah, you, you, you know, you need to maybe take consider giving spots to other people, and that's um, yeah, that's that's where I'm sitting at the moment. But you know, fingers crossed, um, there will be a Tokyo, and yeah, I mean, as I already said, the I've had two Commonwealth Games. And Glasgow was an amazing experience. Gold Coast, again, amazing, but completely different. Um, and the the game the Paralympics in the Paralympics in in Rio uh, was the first para triathlon, so that that was a great experience. And yeah, Tokyo with the relay that is going to be an absolute blast. So you know, fingers crossed, we get there. Yeah, no, certainly. Um, yeah, I know I didn't mean to necessarily put you on the spot. What your yeah your long term future is, but I mean. Um, it's also important for people to know that there, you know, there's there's other sort of roles within the sport. So it's not just purely like going up, up, up. There's, you know, there's looking after other officials and the mentorship you provided, you know, to people like myself and other officials in the program as well, which is important. Yeah, I think Australia is is lucky in as much in as that it has a very a structured program, and um, you go to any event and. Mentoring doesn't necessarily always have to be like from the technical delegate or the head referee or the chiefs down. Somebody who's two years ahead of somebody else can be a mentor. And, you know, and if, when you're at an event, if you're not sure, don't feel that you can't ask. You, you have to ask. That's mistakes are made when people just are too nervous to ask a question. There's, they used to, you know, there's a, there's a saying I use sometimes and it's, um, there's only, there's no stupid questions. There's only people who stay stupid by not asking them. So, um, you know, it's not very complimentary, but if you ask a question, if you get an answer and it's the wrong answer, at least you've got somebody else you can say, well, they told me. So don't, yeah. Yeah, don't, don't put your, don't put your neck on the chopping block. Um, if you're not sure, just ask up, ask up the line. And there's, there's enough people up there who have the right answer. Yeah. yeah. And that's important to know because a lot of new officials coming in going, oh, I'm just scared to ask, but there's never that. It's only the dumb question is the one you don't ask. Yeah. I, I, I always remember, I think it was um, Malulaba, one of the great um, Australian World Cups, and we had officials came in from Papua New Guinea. And again, they were so cautious about, you know, I mean, 
very talented, beautiful, pe- you know, beautiful, great athletes and officials. And but they were they thought, oh, this is you know we're with the we're at the, the you know the big league. And I just said to them, now just find somebody and you know ask questions. And at the end of the, at the end of a few days, they they all had learned a lot and made friends, which is good. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank. I mean, thanks, Frank, for all you've given to the technical program over the years. Um, we've only sort of probably yeah, touched the the tip of the iceberg here in terms of what you have contributed. Um, and yeah, I hope to have you know, plenty more of these chats um, with you in the future. Yeah, thanks, Michael. Well, I just want to say, what you give, you're going to get back ten times. So yeah, keep doing it, people. Enjoy. Stay safe. Wise words. Thanks, Frank. See ya.